on this beautiful rainy day. We made it, we're live streaming right now. So hello, Facebook family, we miss you. I'm glad everybody is safe. And we are here to worship God together. Actually, President Trump ordered this, a national day of prayer. So that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be praying today. We're gonna be praying healing on our country. We're gonna be praying for a cure. It's just, you know what? God is in control and we have to remember that. So before we get started, we always open up our service, joys and concerns. Joys is something you want to share with the whole church family that Jesus is doing in your life. You just want to share the good news of him. Concerns is if you have a prayer request that you'd like the entire church family to be praying for. But if you have a private prayer request, fill out your prayer request sheet in your bulletin online. If you have a prayer request, go ahead and send us a message, and I'll make sure I get that to Pastor Nick and the elders. So if you have anything you'd like to share, just go ahead and raise your hand. Eric. Yes. Everybody can probably hear me without the mic. <laughs> so Charles and uh, Nick both asked about my dad. And uh, as of today, he's doing a little bit better. Uh, he's home now. Um, he's been in and out of the hospital. And, uh, he's definitely uh, in one of the, uh, the high-risk groups now uh, with all the pneumonia and everything he's been dealing with. He actually, <clears throat> he was in the nursing home and somebody in there had the flu. The flu, his roommate did, and so gave it to him and my mom. But um, he's not in the hospital right now. He's doing a little bit better, but keep praying for him because it's, it, it's touch and go. He's in and out, and we're just praying that um, he can get past this, get on the right medications, and have some prolonged health. Hopefully, the good weather will uh, help with that. But thanks for everybody's prayers, too. Remind me of his first name? Robert. Robert. Is there anything else? So there's I have a joy. And that is uh, last week, uh, my husband and I had the honor of taking our food donations over to the food bank. And um, we took 99 pounds. Wow. And so excited. They are concentrating on their seniors right now, and their seniors use the oatmeal and cereal to take their medications. But so thank you all for contributing, and um, let's keep it going. That's right. What do you do? And think about it cereal and oatmeal, it does not weigh a lot. So to have 99 pounds in less than a month, that is amazing. You know, you guys are such a giving community, and we appreciate it. So the next food item that we're going to be donating for the next month, starting today through April 15th, is canned protein. You know, what the heck is canned protein? So peanut butter, I mean, who doesn't like peanut butter? Canned tuna, canned chicken, canned salmon, um, Vienna sausages. Spam. Spam. Thank you, Drake. Spam. Spam burgers. Those are really good. So, you know, when you're out at the store, when the stores get restocked, let's thank of our local food banks because our food banks is feeding our community. So continue to give for that. Is there any other um, prayer requests or any other joys you'd like to share? If anyone wants to share online, go ahead and put it in the comment section and it will pop up as well. But right now we're gonna go ahead and pray. Father God, Lord, I just thank you for being our Father. A Father who loves us, a Father who hears us, who wants to have a relationship with us, Lord God. Father God, I thank you for the work that you are doing, even just right here in our community, Lord, that we're able to provide food for those in our community that aren't able to get food. Father God, right now, I just wanna lift Eric's dad, Robert, up to you. Just continue to heal him, continue to strengthen him, Lord God. I just pray for the doctors that are watching over him, that they are able to find the right medication so that he can just feel better, Lord God, and get back home, Lord. Father God, I pray for our country. I pray for the researchers and the scientists that are working on a vaccination for this pandemic, this coronavirus, Lord God. Lord God, I pray for the families that are home, 
Continue to protect them, Lord. Keep them safe, Lord. Father God, we're going to trust in you. You tell us in your word that you are the great healer, Lord God, and you have healed so many of us, Lord. And we thank you for that. And we love you, Lord God. And we trust you. You are our Father, our Abba, Lord God. Just continue to watch over us and protect us. And it's in your Son's heavenly name that we pray. Amen. Amen.
go on Facebook, and I'm thinking this morning about little Ethan. I'm just praying for him. He's gone through so much. He's such a cute little boy. You see his picture. You see the struggle. And I think about his parents and his grandparents, and Nick and I love him deeply. They used to be here, but they're, they're going through so much. So I'm just asking y'all to lift up little Ethan, Sarah and Nate's little boy. It's, there's power in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Amen. sports jacket. Please forgive me. Praise God. Father, we lift up this time before you today, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to come together as a church family. Thank you uh, that we get to be live, Father, on Facebook. Father, I just pray that the word today will be fruitful. I pray that everything that comes out of my mouth uh, will be pleasing in your sight, Father. We're here to grow. We're here to worship. We're here to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ because that's what we want to do every day here in this house that you've blessed us with. And I give you the glory in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before I continue with the series on heaven, this is like our third week talking about heaven and the other place we talked about last week, hell. I would like to share a couple passages that the Lord put on my heart the last couple days and then a passage that the uh, Lord put on my heart in the last hour, praise God. But I wanted to start with John 16, 32 to 33. Uh, this is Jesus talking to his disciples uh, there in the upper room, it started out in verse uh, chapter 13 with them washing their feet, and then he just goes through and tells them what's going to happen uh, now in the future. And Jesus said to him, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, for the Father's with me. Verse 33 says, I have, and this is for today. For I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's 
Jesus given us assurance now, my NIV commentary said for that verse that states that the disciples had faith. We see it in the Gospels. The disciples had faith, but not enough to stand firm in the face of disaster. Jesus knew they would fall, however. His church is not built on people's strength, but on God's ability to use people even after he failed. I came today to tell you that God's still on the throne. Jesus is still sitting at the right-hand throne of the Father, and he wants to use us. We are ambassadors for him. He's our light and our salvation. That's what I came here to tell you today, that Jesus has overcome the world. Everything we see going on in the world right now, Jesus has overcome the world, and that's why we become overcomers. We were going to show that movie Friday night. Then... I think about trials, and I think about tribulations, and I think about suffering, and it brought me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes this, praise be, and these verses are so, we need these verses today. We need to understand these verses. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a living hope. That's why I asked Rachel to sing that song, Living Hope. He has given us a new birth and a living hope. And you might ask the question, how? Why did he do that? He did it through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's given us these promises, an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. It's one of the reasons why we're doing this series on heaven. It says, whom through faith are shielded by God's power to the coming of the salvation that has ready been revealed in this last time. In all of this, what should be our response? Greatly rejoice. Greatly rejoice. And then it tells us, now Peter lets us know, through every generation since this book has been written, Though now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Why? Why do we have to go through these trials? It says, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, and then in the NIV it has a little dash, your faith, greater worth than gold, which perishes even though we find by fire, and then the little dash may result in the praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So you see from those verses in 1 Peter and the verses in John that the, what a blessings, all the blessings that we have because we're his children, because we have surrendered our life to him and we choose to live for Christ. Uh, Tuesday we were talking about the virus, Keith and I, and, and Keith goes, well, we can really use this to reach out to our neighbors. A lot of people are going to be home now. Now we can reach out to our neighbors. He's telling me this on Tuesday. I drive home on Tuesday. I pull in the driveway, and here comes Steve. He lives in a townhouse, about seven or eight townhouses around the corner. Kathy and I saw him in uh, Subway a year or so ago, and he tells me he goes to the Catholic Church, and he's teaching the third grade here. Well, here I come out of my car, and he walks up to me. I have my book bag with me. He said, Nick, how's the congregation doing? Because he knows I'm a pastor. I said, going great. I said, but there is a battle going on. He goes, well, what do you mean by the battle? I said, well, there's an enemy out there who wants to silence God. There's an enemy out there who wants people to stop being plugged into the church, stop being serious about their relationship with God, and follow the things of this world. And then he shared, you know, Nick, I... He, he's retired military, great guy, he has a con heart condition right now, and uh, his first wife died. He has a daughter in Utah, and he said, Nick, uh, my daughter's in Mormonism. Is there anything you can help me and show me because I want to help her because I realize that Mormonism is a call, and it's not of God, it's not in the Bible. So I took my Bible out, I'm sharing uh, uh, Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9, talking about there's no other gospel. I shared with him Proverbs 35 and 6. You know, we can't add to the Bible, take away from the Bible. And I just wanted to encourage him. And we pray for his daughter here because he wants his daughter to know Christ. So I'm thinking this is a time we can use to reach out to our neighbors. And God might bring the neighbors to you. You know what I mean? To ask those kind of questions. And I'm thinking about these verses in 1 Peter, just been thinking about it. Because Peter's telling us now for a little while, 
you know, in this nation, around this world, we may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. This country now, as well as the whole world, is suffering grief through what they have named the coronavirus. And then I started thinking about, well, wasn't there a, a big flu epidemic called the swine flu back in 2009? Anybody remember that? I looked up the statistics of that, I was in shock. Because I don't remember any of this thing being said while this was going on. In March 2010, it was shared that this swine flu, 59 million Americans contracted the H1N1 virus, that they called back then. Back then in 2009 and 2010, there were over 265,000 people that were hospitalized during that virus. And as a result, I found out 12,000 people died in 2009 from the swine flu. And I thought to myself, wow, that's incredible. Then I found out in 2017 and 18, 80,000 people died of the influenza flu. So these flus and viruses have been going on for a while. Praise God that we have a president that's doing what he can to help people, so less people be con contracted with this virus. So we need to pray for our leaders. We need to do that. And then I thought to myself, I haven't heard anything on the news about how many babies have been killed in the last week. Have you? Have you heard about that? And I thought, well, let me get some statistics. Last year in the world, 42.4 million babies were aborted. I don't see anybody up in arms about that. And then I ask myself, you know, and I'm starting to get a little heavy here, is Planned Parenthood gonna shut down the next couple weeks? Do you think that will happen? I mean, it's very sad, and you do the math, and I get my calculator out on my phone, in the world, that means every day, 81,538 babies are aborted. Every day, well, every week, every day, it's 11,648. So we have a lot of things that we need to, you know, give over to the Lord and think to myself, the evilness that's in this place, in this place called Planned Parenthood, uh, should we be funding them? Yeah. So we have these trials, we have these things we go through, and Peter tells us why do they happen so we would be proven genuine of our faith, it's greater worth than gold. So it's very important. So last week I talked about, in the second series, lesson on the series of heaven, I talked about there's only two immediate places that we can go when we die. The first immediate place is heaven and it's called paradise. And the only other option that I shared last week is an immediate hell called Hades. Now C.S. Lewis in his book, uh, mere Christianity shared this about heaven that I'd like to talk about today. The point is not that God will refuse you admission to his eternal world if you have not certain qualities of character. And then C.S. Lewis goes on in Mere Christianity and says, the point is that if people not to God, that have not got at least the beginning of these qualities inside them, then there's no possible external conditions could make a heaven for them. And I thought in 1 Corinthians 15, which is my main passage today, behold, I tell you, Paul wrote, behold, with an exclamation point, I tell you, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. And we saw last week in the message that when it talks about sleep in the Bible, it's really a metaphor for death. In verse 53, it says, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must be put on the immortality. And when perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality, then it shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. When you have Christ as your Lord and Savior and you die, you have victory because you get to spend eternity in heaven. 
And Paul writes, oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory in Jesus. Amen. Today, I'd like to cover a few questions that you might have uh, about heaven that, you might, uh, that we can see today. Because I truly believe when God created us, he put eternity in our hearts. About heaven, will there be any work in heaven? Or will we just sit idly? So I'm being sure that I don't think we're going to sit idly in heaven. What do you think God's going to say when we get to heaven? I don't think he's going to say, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. You can have the rest of the eternity off, praise God. Now, like they're saying, you can have the next two weeks off, praise God. Matthew 25, 21 says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Who wouldn't want God to say that to them when they leave this earth? Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, that doesn't sound like we're going to be sitting around heaven uh, forever and ever. It sounds like we'll be doing many things. There'll be many things to do. For one, we know that we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ over this renovated earth. Revelation 22, 3 says, no longer will there be anything accursed. Isn't that powerful? What a hope that we have as followers of Christ. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. You know, God has a great plan for each one of us to be wonderfully happily, excitedly employed serving the Lord in paradise. And when we serve him to the fullest expression of the capacity of God has given us until the gift, using the giftness that he has placed within us. And then I can tell you today that we won't experience any difficulties, any flus, any pressures, any stresses, any heartaches that accompany the work down here on earth. And we cannot comprehend, I can't put it into words and find the words, the glorious work which we will be occupied throughout eternity. But we'll know that our service there will result in a deep joy and fulfillment. Randy Alcorn, a great pastor, great writer, in his book called Heaven, he said this, what will it be like in heaven to perform a task to build and create knowing that we will be doing everything we do will last forever and ever. What will it be like to always be gaining skills so our best work will always be ahead of us for eternity? And because our minds and our bodies will never fade and because we will never lack the resources and opportunities, our work won't be degenerate. Buildings, uh, Randy Alcor wrote, buildings won't last for only 50 years, and our books won't be in print for 20 years. They'll last forever. They'll last for eternity. Next question I thought some people might ask, will heaven ever be boring? And God, when you think about God and you read his word and you put it in, a, in your heart, he's the most exciting, adventuresome, created person that you can ever imagine multiplied a thousand times over. We can't even comprehend here on earth a morsel of the excitement that is resident in the triune God with whom we are going to spend eternity. The psalmist said this in Psalm 1611, you made known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, our pleasures are forevermore. I sat today with a couple ladies in our community group. We had just a great, great time of fellowship. Regina and Shelby, thank you. They're so much faster than me than looking up the word. Pastor Dick, it was unbelievable. And we shared any of these verses, uh, Joe, I gave to you earlier, the Psalm 73, 23 through 25. 
This is a promise that I want to give you today. This is a hope I want you to feel in the presence of all these things that are going on around the world. It says in verse 23, Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me into glory. What a promise from God's word. What a hope we have in him. Verse 25 says, whom, I, whom have I in heaven but you? Think about it. And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. What a beautiful verse is in there. It's, it's, it's incredible, man. Seriously. We will never engage in anything that leaves us feeling even a tad bit empty in heaven. Everything we do in heaven will be absolute and total fulfillment and joy because that's the way God created us. In Ecclesiastes, which came about the titles for this message, he has made everything beautiful in his time, Solomon wrote. Also, he has put eternity in man's heart, yet he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. But I'm going to tell you one day, we will find out. Amen. We will see him face to face. We will see him now as, as he is when we get to heaven for eternity. And this means that God has built us as believers with a space within us that can't be fully satisfied with anything else except heaven. Amen. I mean, we might be satisfied with things for a season. Things might get us pumped up and excited, but nothing will be excited. And I thought to myself, wow, there hasn't been any sports on TV for a week. Can you imagine living without sports? Oh my gosh, baseball's two weeks late. Oh my gosh. But that's not the, that's the reason we're not going to be bored in heaven. It's everything our hearts will long for. In paradise, we will finally feel that completeness that we were created to enjoy. Then I thought the question, well, who are going to be heaven's residents? You know, obviously all of those who have surrendered their life to Christ. But in Hebrews, I found a couple verses in Hebrews. I thought were pretty cool. They kind of, they kind of give us a list of heaven's residents. Check these two verses out. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in a festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God and the judge of all and the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So as believers, we're going to spend eternity with an innumerable company of angels. And I think it'll be men and women who were made perfect. And they're the Old Testament saints. And they're the people of the firstborn who represent the church. And above all, we're going to spend eternity with God. Question number four, some people might ask, will we have fellowship with one another in heaven? And I would say like never before, because we will be God's people made over. We will be perfectly compatible with one another and able for the first time ever to enjoy intimate fellowship with. That's what we long for in our hearts. And if heaven weren't exciting enough, imagine having unlimited opportunity to fellowship with people from all ages. Even people we've only read about in books. Then I thought about who would I want to meet in heaven? And I thought about David, Joseph, Daniel in the Old Testament, Peter and Paul from the New Testament. Then I thought about people, uh, C.S. Lewis, Oswald Chambers. Man, I can't wait to meet him and say, man, that's the greatest devotion book ever. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, A.W. Tozer, Martin Luther. I'd love to meet all those people. Then I thought to myself, well, who were my heroes growing up? And I'm going to be honest with you. You know who my heroes were growing up? Willie Mays. Juan Marichal, they were my heroes. Martin Luther King was a hero of mine when I was growing up. I thought, wow, a man that comes out and says, hey, let's judge each other by our character, not the color of our skin. Amen. Powerful, powerful. I 
thought about Michael Landon. I'd like to meet him in heaven. I love all the things he wrote. I cried many times watching The Little House. And then I thought about my dad, Nicholas Silvestro Jr. I can't wait to be with him again. I had the honor of praying with him to receive Christ. Can you imagine seeing people that you've had the privilege to lead to Christ and live out your faith in front of them, that you'll be fellowshipping with them in heaven? Seriously, who would you like to meet in heaven? I had that for your question for community groups next week. Who would you like to meet in heaven? And I don't think we can possibly comprehend it completely, but we're going to live together in community and be able to have unlimited fellowship with one another in eternity. We won't have to look at the clock. We won't have to worry about that. And then I thought, think about our church name, Community Christian Fellowship. That's what heaven's going to be about, fellowship on all those believers. Then I thought, this might be a question a kid would ask. Will there be animals in heaven? <laughs> Praise God. Did a lot of thinking about that, a lot of searching for that. And I really felt like scripture doesn't really co conclusively tell us whether our pets will make it to heaven. However, the Bible does provide us with some significant clues regarding whether or not animals will inhabit the new heaven and the new earth. Think about it. And then I look back and I think, well, animals were in the Garden of Eden, right? So there might be a precedent, precedent for believing in animals will populate Eden restored as well. Animals are among God's most creative creations. Thus, it would seem incredible that he would banish such wonders from heaven. Then I thought, furthermore, why can we not say for certain that our pets that we enjoy will be resurrected for eternity? And I'm not willing to say that's a possibility. I don't know. Kathy and I had dog Rocky for 10 years. But then I thought about some of our keenest thinkers like C.S. Lewis, Lewis or like Peter Kreb are not only convinced that animals, if you read their writing, they are convinced that animals in general, but that pets in particular will be restored in resurrection. If God resurrected our pets, it would be total in total keeping, I think, with his overwhelming grace and goodness towards us. One thing is for certain, scripture does provide us with scripture uh, for believing that animals will inhabit a new heaven, a new earth. And I found this in Isaiah, verse chapter 11, verse 6. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, and the little child shall lead them. Isn't that beautiful? David wrote in Psalms 145, 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generation. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. And then the last question I want to share with you today, how old will we be in heaven? Isn't that a great question? And once again, I didn't really find anything in the scriptures that uh, specifically address the apparent age. However, it does provide, I think, glorious insights concerning the state of our resurrected bodies. And I thought, well, let's see. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them with an apparent age, and I think in the crime, in the prime of their life. Additionally, when you think about Jesus, when he was resurrected in the prime of his physical development at age 33, Thus, we're justified, I think, in believing that whether we die in infancy or in our prime or in our old age, we will be resurrected physically mature and perfect as God originally intended. And then I thought about our DNA. Furthermore, our DNA is programmed in such a way that at a particular point, we reach optimal development from a functional perspective. For the most part, it appears that we reach this stage between our 20s and 30s. I would say ladies, 18 to 25, guys from 30 to 40, no, anyway, praise God. But prior to this stage, the development of our bodies, anomalism 
that's the synthesis of living organisms of more complex substances than the simpler ones. Didn't mean to go science here, but they will exceed the devolution of our bodies, our uh, catabolism, uh, the breaking down in living organisms of a more complex substance into simpler ones with the release of energy. So I think to myself, from this point on, the rate of breakdown in our bodies exceeds the rate of buildup, am I right? Which eventually leads to physical death. All of this is to say that I feel like the blueprint for our glorified bodies in, the, in our DNA, then it would stand to reason that our bodies will be resurrected as an optimum age, stage of development determined by our DNA. And finally, one thing I can state with certainty in heaven, there'll be no deformities in heaven. The body which is tarnished by humans, humanity's fall into life of constant sin terminated by death will be utterly transformed. You will be the perfect you. I will be the perfect me. Indeed, in heaven, it's going to be powerful. And I thought about all my throws from third base to first base in heaven are going to be perfect. Remember Pastor Dick all that time bounced it in the first, threw it over his head. It's going to be perfect when I get to heaven. They write in Revelations, this is a promise for us today. He'll wipe away every tear from your eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 tells us, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The, then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing joy. And the waters break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert. That's powerful. The ushers want to come forward. Think about that. And therefore, hearing all this today, all these promises from God's word, all the hope that we can find in the scripture that we need today, I thought I would close with this verse. And then I thought about, we should close with this verse every week. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. We want to live in this generation. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So I love talking about the beauty of heaven. And it's hard talking about the tragedy of hell. But there's really only two places that we're set to go when we leave this earth. So as I close today, does anybody want to add their name added to the book of life? If you're looking at us on Facebook today and you realize, wow, I need Christ to make it to heaven and you want to receive him in your life, just bow your head and close your eyes right now. Let me pray for you and pray for this offering. Father, right now, I pray for those who might have had a touch in their heart or a knock on the door in their heart like Jesus talks about in Revelations, Father. That they realize that they're a sinner and they realize that Christ dying on the cross, Christ coming to earth, living the sinful life, dying, being buried and rising again and sitting at the right hand throne of God, paid the price for every one of our sins. The sins before, the sins right now, and the sins in the future, Father. So right now, I want to ask you into my heart, Father. I want to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I want to believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And the Bible says we shall be saved. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray that you bless our offering today. Father, I pray that you bless our worship time and this altar time. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
have a seat. Um, if you just turn your bulletins over, I just want to highlight a few things. And for those of you watching live, uh, you'll be able to get our bulletin uh, for today here shortly. I'll upload it to our website, which is www.ccf-va.org. And there on our website, we have the ability to do our online tithing. You ha we have buttons there that you can see all the upcoming events. We have everything on there. So take a look at our website. And we'll also be putting updates throughout the week on our website, as well as we'll be emailing everybody as we figure out how we're going to manage the week um, in regards to our Wednesday nights, our Wednesday morning, our Thursday. So be sure to take a look at your Facebook page, your email, and we will announce everything. The one thing that I do know is canceled is our outreach event for our foster care. We were going to assemble bags together in March. We're going to reschedule that to a later time frame, so be on the lookout for that. Um, so basically, that's it right now. Take a look at our website, Facebook. We're just going to flood social media with everything that's going on in regards to all our different studies. But you know what? We're going to continue to pray as a church family. We're going to continue to pray for our country and our scientists and our researchers and for everyone here because God is our healer. Amen. Right now I'm going to have Eric come up and close us in prayer. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, <clears throat> this is the new normal. Yeah. <laughs> Never go anywhere. Without this. Also, first I want to say I, in no way am I trying to make light of this situation. But uh, you guys know me. Uh, I like to use humor uh, wherever I can. So I'm not trying to make light of the situation. Um, but I do want to add a number seven. Will there be toilet paper in heaven? <laughs> I'm going to study that this week. Will there be toilet paper in heaven? Is there any toilet paper left anywhere? Yeah. And, um, that's you. Our bathroom is fully stocked. Our, <laughs> right, that's for the Facebook Live people. If you need to go to the bathroom, we have a Come place for you. Okay. But it's between you and God if you leave with an entire roll. <laughs> or, or more than one roll. Okay? Um, and also, uh, you know, Nick's been uh, teaching us about heaven, and he taught us uh, last week, a couple weeks ago, about how we try to create our heaven on earth. And, and to me, that's what, a little bit of what's going on when we, when we buy all that toilet paper. When we, when we try to set things up here on earth to make us feel like we're safe, protected. Um, so it's just another reason to focus. And I'm actually going to say this. Um, focus on God. But listen, corona, the meaning of corona is actually an aura or light around the sun. OK? And so what sun should our focus be on right now? And I told somebody, you gotta, you gotta make lemonade out of lemons, okay? And like, they're bringing, they're bringing everybody back to the family right now. They're saying, uh, we're closing everything, but we have to use it as an opportunity, okay? To say, we're gonna take this time, we're gonna focus on the real Quran, okay? We're gonna focus on God. We're going to pray back, and what we're going to try to not do, and we're going to we're going to pray about this. We're going to try not to panic, okay? And we know that things are happening out there to people. That's why I say we're not making light of this. People are dying because of this, okay? We need to make sure that we let everyone that we can know about God, about Jesus, about we don't have to have fear of dying. 
we don't have to have fear of viruses, okay? Because there is a place that we are going, which is heaven, that is better than this earth, okay? And so we just have to remember that. And that's what separates us from, from everyone. That's what's supposed to separate us, is the peace that we have. And we shouldn't be a part of the problem, okay? We need to be a part of letting people know that there's a hope out there. There's bad things going on. It can get scary out there, but you know what? There's a difference, okay? And all we have to do is believe in Jesus, okay? Believe in Jesus, okay? And he gives us that path to heaven. He is heaven for us. So I know it's the... Um, I know it's the, and, and uh, the president has declared a national day of prayer, uh, and so I would just ask us all to be in prayer today, okay? Be in prayer for our families, be in prayer for everyone out there. Those that don't know the Lord, that someone is put in their path. But, I mean, I, I'm sure there's some folks here, there's folks everywhere who are scared. I thought, um, what better way than to just read Psalm 23? Um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in one. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Amen. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Heavenly Amen. Father, fill us up with your Holy Spirit, Father. Let us not succumb to fear, Lord. Let us continue to love others. Jeff said it earlier, perfect love casts out fear. Father, let us love like we've never loved before. When it's the hardest, Father, is when we need you the most. Be with us. Help us to love our neighbors, our friends, our family, Father everyone around us, Lord. Thank you so much for your son, for this church family, Father, for Pastor Nick, for everyone, Lord. I just ask you to be with us as we go over these next few weeks, Father, and just help us to keep our gaze on you, Father, on the aura of the light around the sun, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.